Good morning. So glad you're here. Wind blown as you may be, we're glad you're here. If you would stand with me and we'll sing New Life in Christ. We'll do that a couple of times to get us into praise. New life in Christ, abundant and free. What glory shine, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searching and strife, forever gone. There's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life, new life in Christ. Abundant and free, what glory shine, what joys are mine, what wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searching and strife, forever gone. There's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life. Next, praise him as surely the presence. <laughs> surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels wing. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace i can hear the brush of angels wing i see glory on each face surely the presence of the lord is in this place amen aren't you thankful this morning for the presence of the lord I'm glad we can feel him. I'm glad we can know him. I'm glad he's a very real and vital part of our lives this morning. Amen. And thankful for that. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask his blessing as we start our service. Charlie, would you open up this morning, please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning. We are glad you are here today. It's a windy day. It's a chilly day. It's a slightly rainy day, but you're here, and we're thankful for that. God bless you, and uh, we're glad that you're here. We have any very first time guests this morning? Very first time. I want to greet you and welcome you this morning. All right. All right. We do have one right up here in the front. She came all the way from Kansas City just to hear me preach today. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> she came to be with her family, and this is just not even a bonus. This is like a uh, penalty. You have to be here today to hear me because it's a penalty. But uh, thank you for being with us today. We enjoy having you, and if you'll uh, fill that out, I'll, I'll meet you at the, our brand-new Welcome Center out, out after the service, and we'll exchange that for a nice gift for you to take home, all right? Amen. Thank you for being with us. Um, where's Gail? Gail. Yes, Gail. Um, Gail is here today, and I just want to give everybody a quick warning. Um, she's got her two granddaughters with her, and the last time her and her two granddaughters were in this building, I blew out my meniscus. So stay away from Gail. Just kind of walk, give her a wide berth as you walk around her. And 
<laughs> Wayne, be careful today, all right? But uh, <laughs> I was giving her a hard time but this morning, but uh, we're glad they're with us as well over in the kids' class, so amen. But, uh, it's good to be in God's house, and I'm looking forward to worshiping them together and, and to singing and fellowshipping, just smiling and laughing and having a good time in God's house. So I hope that you will enjoy uh, that together. I think at this time, Kathy's going to come make a couple of announcements. Is that right? I don't know. I just worked here. I don't know what's going on. Okay. All right. If you'll turn in your worship folders to the announcement page, we have a few. Uh, business meeting is coming up on the 18th at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and that's the time when we'll go through our end-of-year financials and take a look at them. Uh, food pantry, there will be a cooking class uh, on the uh, t uh, 20th, 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the fellowship kitchen. Men's breakfast, uh, you're enjoying each other's fellowship and some food on the 21st at 8 o'clock in the morning in the fellowship hall. Uh, fifth Sunday potluck, mark your calendar. Uh, that's on January 29th, fifth Sunday of, of January, and we're going to have a wonderful service on that day and then a potluck to follow. Deacons and trustees, your meeting has been uh, rescheduled to February 7th at 5 o'clock church office. And for those of you who still have some cards, and I, I know there are a few of you here today, they're not, we've moved them from the back table to out at the new Welcome Center. So as you leave today, check and see if you have some cards that you have not picked up from Christmas. We'd like to have you pick those up today, please. And the other announcement I want to make, uh, there's a poster out in the uh, lobby about uh, the Cragans. Now, if you've not heard the Cragans, you will be blessed if you go to a concert and get an opportunity to hear the Cragans. They are going to be uh, at, uh, at the Community Bible Church, and that's going to be on the 19th, uh, 7 o'clock. There will be a free will offering taken for them. So if you, as I said, if you have not heard them, they are wonderful, and you really will be blessed by their, by their musical uh, ability. Also, birthdays and anniversaries. Again, keep the Good News Club in your prayers. Uh, let's really pray for encouragement of the workers as well as uh, uh, steady growth for the club. We need to keep, uh, keep that in our focus and keep praying about that every day. Uh, we have choir practice at 5 o'clock and evening service at 6 today and 7 on Wednesday. Our next hymn is A Mighty Fortress. more. 
next hymn is Joy Unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Glory on the hat has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a joyous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the hat has never yet been told. I have found that hope so bright and clear, living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near, I can see his smiling it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the hat has never yet been told. I have found the joy no tongue can tell, how it brings the glory like a giant old flowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the truth has never yet been Our next song is In Times Like These. <clears throat> In times like these, you need the Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid this rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have a Savior in times like these. I have an anchor, I'm very sure. 
I'm very sure my anchor holds and grips a solid rock. in my trials and more sorrow for my sin a deeper faith in you dear Lord please give me every day let me find joy in my journey and more purpose when I pray, this is my prayer, Lord, when this day is through, was I a little less like me, and a little more like you, my lone desire. In all I say or do, was I a little less like me and a little more like you? gratitude help me to love you even more take pride only in your glory and trust only in your word let me show sorrows tears when others pain when others grieve and my neighbor may see Jesus every time that he sees me this is my prayer lord when this day is through was i a little less like me and a little more like you my lord in all I say or do was I a little less like me and a little more like you when this day is through was I a little less like me a little more like you was I a little less like me and a little more like you
Ramona for that song. Appreciate that. What a uh, what a good desire to have in our lives, right there. The only way you can't go wrong, you can't go wrong with less of you and more of him. That's for sure. Uh, thank you for that, Ramona. Appreciate that song very much. If you want to turn ahead in your scripture, we're going to go to Second Corinthians five. If you want to find your way there, we're going to read in just a moment. Second Corinthians chapter five. I'll be a blessing to you this morning. That is right after First Corinthians. So uh, if you're having trouble finding it, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, I, uh, I've been preparing this message for about five weeks. Um, I'm really, really super duper pumped to preach this message. I don't always get up here and say stuff like that, but uh, the, the driving force and the thought behind this message, I think, is not because I'm preaching it, but I think is so going to be so helpful for our church and, and, and any church across the country that would preach a message like this. Uh, I really think it's going to be life-changing. Uh, we go through life today, and one thing I've noticed is this. Um, I'm going to preach on five church hacks this morning, okay? And one thing you'll notice in life, especially as you're living it, if you ever watch TV or you have the internet, uh, you see all kinds of this stuff, right? Party food hacks, hey, they make the best party food, and they give you all these ideas. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of you are with me? How many of you know I clue what I'm talking about? Let me see your hands. All right, three or four of you, all right? You'll find out by the time we're done. These are secrets to get doing something better, okay? Uh, uh, weird hacks that really work, and they, you know, they get a quarter, and you do this with it, and do this with it, and all of a sudden something miraculous happens. You know, it's, it's just an amazing thing. Life hacks. Life hacks. We're going to help you enjoy life more. Ten clever kitchen hacks. We all need that, right? Now, let me ask you this question real quick before I go further. How many of you have ever followed one of these things and tried it, and it worked, and you're like, whoa, I wish I'd been doing that all my life? No, one or two of you, all right, one or two of you, all right, there's a couple out there, and you're like, well, that was really helpful, 20 best hacks, again, you see, these are just some, some, some popular random ones that are out there, five awesome hacks for recycling, I, I'm going to give you one easy step for recycling, you ready, throw it in the trash, <laughs> oh, pastor, you don't care about our environment, shut up, <laughs> recycle, another one, life hacks, okay, and you see these all over the place, survival life hacks, man, if you're caught in the wilderness and a bear's on your tail, here's how to survive, run faster than the person you're with, that's all it takes, I'm going to tell you right now, all right, take my wife with you, everybody can run faster than her, all right, but, uh, <laughs> oh man, listen to y'all, that was true, that was true, she'll admit to that, we were out one time hiking with, with the kids and I uh, and her, and that's what one of them said to her, Mom, we don't have to worry about anything. We just have to outrun you, and that's not a problem. She's like, you're right. You're right. So, so all those hacks are out there, you know, electronic hacks. There's all, I mean, you can, just about anything in life, they've got somebody saying, here's, here's some tips, some hints that will help you do this better, something you didn't know about before that will help you enjoy this. All, I want to give you this morning five church hacks. Five church hacks. Now, I want to say this first of all, and we'll get, we'll get into the scripture here in just a second, Okay. I grew up in church. I have spent 50 years of my life in church. Uh, my dad was a pastor. I went to church every time the doors were open. I went Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival services, mission services, prayer services, Bible study, uh, fellowships. Uh, but if the doors open, so somebody come, come in and clean the carpet, I had to be there. I, I mean, that's just, that I, I grew up in church. Okay, I am extremely comfortable in church. Uh, I wasn't real comfortable last week preaching in a t-shirt, but other than that, uh, I'm, a, I'm extremely comfortable in church. I have no problems walking into church and saying, this is my crowd, this is my place, this is my God, this is my worship. I love it, okay? I have no problems being comfortable here. However, let me just say this, and this is the kind of the driving force for the message. There are a lot of people today, we have a lot of different variety of backgrounds here in our midst this morning. Some of you maybe didn't grow up in church. Some of you maybe it's your first or second or third time or you're relatively new to the church and you're still trying to find your way. You're still trying to get into that comfortable spot at church. Uh, I want to give you five things today that I believe will help you to enjoy church more uh, be more comfortable in the church setting and understand what the whole church is all about. And I want to give you those this morning. Uh, before I do, let me get into the scripture here. For 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Won't you stand with me real quick? We'll read this together out loud. Now, let me explain for those of you who struggle with that word. Together out loud means together out loud. All right? 
So you, you join with me, all right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How many of you already knew that verse? A whole bunch of you, all right? Let's say it one more time together. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Father, we love you today. We thank you for the time we've had to be in your house. Lord, it's been encouraging to sing songs of praise to your name. It's been encouraging to worship with these dear people that are assembled together. Uh, Lord, we ask you now to bless the message. Lord, I believe with all my heart this is exactly what you want me to preach today. Uh, Lord, I've prepared, I've studied, I've done exactly what you've asked me to do. And I pray now for a blessing upon this message. May it be used to help and to encourage and to edify uh, the brethren in Christ. Uh, may it be used to, to further our church as we go forward with God. Uh, Lord, just use the message to hit its mark. Lord, may it be applied to our lives and our hearts. And of course, God, if there's one that's not saved today, doesn't know Christ. Well, we also pray today would be the day they got saved and trusted you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, we plead the blood of Christ now on this message. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. May I say exactly what you'd want said. Nothing more, nothing less. Keep Satan from our midst, distractions from our minds. And Lord, just help us to focus on the word of God this morning, we pray. We thank you and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I want to quickly tell you about the very first time I was in prison. Now, for some of you, you would say, well, I've been in multiple times, so which experience do you want to hear about? I'm kidding. <laughs> I was uh, years ago pastoring, and uh, we had a prison ministry to the male prison. Actually, we had a female one as well, but uh, the male prison population. And one of the guys in our church was uh, kind of head of that ministry up. It wasn't something that I did. I'd go occasionally. But uh, I hadn't been at this point, particular point. He headed up that ministry. And uh, he asked me one day, he said, hey, this Thursday night, would you go with me to the prison? I want you to preach to the, to the prisoners or the inmates. Nowadays, you have to be politically correct and call them offenders. <laughs> Anyways, he asked me if I'd go. And my first thought that came to my mind was this. Prison? What? Prison. I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable in prison. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like prison. <laughs> I don't want to go to prison. I don't understand prison. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know about this, right? I didn't know what to expect when I got there. Uh, needless to say, when I got there and even leading up to getting there, I was extremely uncomfortable. I remember the car ride to the prison. I agreed to go. And I remember I was dry, uh, ride, riding in the passenger seat, and I remember about partway there, he looked over at me and said, are you okay? And I said, hey, I'm fine. He said, what is wrong with you? And I said, man, I'm really nervous. I don't do prison. I, I, this isn't my place. That's not where I'm comfortable. And he said, well, let, me, let me help you a little bit. And he gave me some tips and some hints and some ideas on how to be comfortable where I was going to do what I was going to do. I asked him, I said, what am I supposed to do? Let me ask you this. Do I walk into the room full of prisoners and just punch the biggest guy in the mouth and establish dominance? He said, no, 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 you're visiting the prison, you're not in prison, okay? No, don't, 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 do, don't do that. I said, well, what do I do? I don't know. He said, let me give you some help. And he gave me a few simple pointers to make me feel comfortable in a place that I was no way going to feel comfortable in. You know, the first thing he told me, he said, just breathe, dude. Pastor, take a breath. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He told me, he said, um, be yourself. Don't try to be, you know, don't, start, don't start talking ghetto because you're in the prison. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Nobody using yo and bro and all. You, you just talk, all right? Just be yourself. Be normal. He said, smile. Be happy. Uh, he, he, he said, be positive. He said, have a normal conversation like, with this person like you were outside of these walls. Just be real. Uh, he said, don't ask what they're in for. You probably don't want to know, <laughs> okay? Don't ask what you're, they're in for. He said, don't tell him your first name. Everybody that were in prison, whenever we went, was always Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. He said, don't shy away from them. Don't let them intimidate you. They won't, they might, you might have a few try, but don't shy away. Just be yourself and be normal. I listened to those things, and I tried those things, and went to prison that night, and we had a, a service there in the prison. Now, I tell you that to tell you this. Some of you today might be sitting in church today feeling the way I felt. I'm, I'm just not real comfortable yet. 
I don't know what's expected of me. I don't know what to expect. I'm still new. I'm new. Or, or I've been coming for a while, but I still don't, don't firmly have a grasp. I'm being comfortable in my church. Help me, preacher. What do I do? I'm going to give you five hacks. Now, you all get your pen out and write this down. I'm going to give you five hacks that if you follow, I guarantee you will enjoy your level of church. The enjoyment of the level of church experience will increase by 42%. I guarantee it. If I'm wrong, you can get your money back. Go talk to Roger, okay? And uh, <laughs> he'll, he'll get that back to you. But I want to give you some five, five. These are simple things. But I think they will truly help you be comfortable, be uh, ready, be excited, uh, feel like this is your place, and know what's expected and what you can expect when you're here. So I want to give you these things this morning. Who wants to hear these, 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 these five things? Say amen. amen. Who doesn't want to? Somebody hold my mic. I got to go slap someone. <laughs> Amen. All right. How do we really enjoy church? How do we get excited about church? How do we get comfortable? This is my place. I'm going to give you number one. I'm going to give you number one. Don't laugh. Number one, show up. Show up. You have to show up to enjoy church. You cannot enjoy church if you're not at church. I sound so smart, don't I? <laughs> I know church. Okay, let me say it this way. I know some of you in here are very theologic, theolog theologically smart. Probably smarter than me. And I know what you're thinking. Pastor church is a people, not a place. I understand that. But if you don't show up with the people, you can't enjoy the place. Church is enjoyed when we show up. The writer of Hebrews reminds us in chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. As Christians, we should not forsake church, as some who call themselves Christians but never come to church. Now, do you have to, be, uh, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? No. No. Christianity is based on the grace of God that we receive through faith. Shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes me a Christian. That's what makes me a child of God. However, comma space. However, if I want to grow in grace and I want to be the Christian God wants me to be, and if I want to learn and I want to mature and I want to serve and I want to give and I want to be part of something, church is kind of necessary. Church is kind of necessary. Instead, as Christ's return draws near, we see this, we should be exhorting and edifying each other all the more. Honestly, if you think about it, we should be having church every day because we need it. <laughs> we, we need it. And the world needs us. Uh, you can't enjoy church if you don't assemble. <laughs> I'm going to say number one. You say show up. Ready? Number one. Well, that was weak. Number one. Show up. Show up. You say, Pastor, okay, great. Show up. Wow, I'm here. Why are you preaching to me? Why are you preaching to me? Because showing up is more than just being here once in a blue moon. Showing up is a matter of consistency. Showing up is a matter of redundancy, if you will. It's I'm here, and I'm here again, and I'm here again, and I'm here again. Show up. Now, to show up, let me give you a couple thoughts. First of all, if you're going to show up, you got to plan ahead. you got to plan ahead. The number one reason people don't go to church is because they don't plan to. It's that simple. You never accidentally go to church. You don't get, remind me of your name. Patty, you're getting embarrassed in your first service here. She's from out of town and she's been visiting Benson to see some sights, okay? You don't get in your car Sunday morning and drive over to, because, because the ice cream shop is closed, you go to Native Grounds and get you a nice caramel latte or, or frappuccino, okay? And you get in your car and you drive over to Benson Donut and get you a couple donuts. And all of a sudden, oh, I ended up in church. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's not an accident. It's never a mistake. You show up because you made a plan to show up. I love this phrase. I wish I could, I wish I could have credit for it, but I can't, I can't. Somebody else said this. They said this. Sunday church is a Saturday decision. 
Sunday church is a Saturday decision. You are here today because at some point yesterday you said this. Tomorrow, Sunday, I'm going to go to church. You decided it yesterday. You decided yesterday. Now, some of you in this room, you made a commitment years ago to say this. I'm going to show up every time the doors are open. Uh, if the church is having church, I'm going to be there. And you made that commitment years ago. Uh, and, and some people probably need to consider making that commitment. Amen? Oh, me. Oh, me. Huh? Here's the thing. The, the, the more committed I am to church, it, more, it becomes more natural to me. And then I start to become more comfortable in a place like this. Plan ahead. Plan ahead. Uh, especially, by the way, if you have small children. You got... J- <laughs> Jelaine, she's got a couple young girls. She's got a plan way ahead to get the girls dressed, whether they're wearing, feed them breakfast, uh, make sure they've got everything ready to get here, make sure they have the right shoes on, the right feet, and they match. My wife still struggles with that too, so don't worry, it's not just the kids. But <laughs> you got to plan ahead. You take care of an elderly person. Uh, you have chores at your house, feeding an animal, whatever. You, can. you have to plan ahead to make today possible. You got to plan ahead. I think the biggest reason why folks don't plan ahead, honestly, and, and I'm, I'm being real and transparent and, and honest with you this morning. I think the biggest reason please, people don't plan ahead is because they don't want to. They don't want to come. They don't want to come to church. You say, what, pastor, what are you talking about? I'm going to share with you a pastoral secret that maybe no pastor has ever shared with you before. Okay, here it is. No one wants to come to church on Sunday. What? I hear you. What about you, Pastor? Especially me. (laughs) Especially me. Let me explain. You think you want to come to church, and then there are times you think you don't want to come to church. You want to come, and then sometimes you don't want to come. You ever been on your way to church and thought right in the middle of the drive, I don't think I should go today? It's happened. It's happened. You ever wake up on Sunday and you'd rather spend time with St. Pillow and Father Mattress? Come on. Huh? Why? Why? Especially if church is a doer thing to you. Why do you experience that? Here's the reason. And by the way, let me say this. You might think you're the only one that ever thinks that. You're not. I might have said all that and you're like, man, he knows. He's reading my mind. No. It's not just you. We all go through this. Okay? We all go through this. Let me show you the why. Get this. Get this, okay? Going to church is not the same as going to Costco. Okay? Let me explain. You can decide one morning to wake up and say, I'm going to Costco. And you get your wallet, you get your keys, uh, you get all five credit cards, you jump in your car, and you just go to Costco. Right? No big deal. Come home, you're done. It's over. Here's the why. Hold on. If you decide Saturday, I'm going to get up Sunday and go to church. From that moment until this morning when church starts, there is a spiritual battle that starts taking place in your life. You have a battle brewing inside of you. The enemy, Satan, and all of his forces are doing everything they can to convince you. You don't need it today. It's okay to miss today. Stay home and sleep today. Do something for yourself today. It's all right. And at the same time, God through the Holy Spirit is doing all he can to say, get into my house, fellowship with me, come on, come on, today's the day. And there's a spiritual battle brewing. You may not realize it, but I believe with all my heart, there's an extra element of spiritual warfare that takes place on Saturday night all the way through Sunday morning. Because if Satan can keep you from where you ought to be, he's going to do everything he can to do it. That's why you want to come to church, you think you should go, I need to be there. Okay, I made it. I enjoyed the service. I went home. I can't wait to come back next Sunday. And then Saturday night before the next Sunday, you start thinking, should I go? Am I going to go this week? What's happening? Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is taking place. You have to plan ahead. I will be there. Period. End of discussion. Now, let me, let me put a little, little parenthesis in here, okay? If you are coughing up a lung, don't come. If you got COVID, don't come. All right? If your nose is running green snot all the way down your face, don't come. If you are dead, don't come. Okay? 
if you're at work, don't tell the boss, I've got to take a couple hours off to go to church and I'll come back. That ain't going to fly, okay? I understand that. But you've got to plan ahead. You've got to plan ahead. Secondly, let me say this about showing up. Arrive early. Arrive early. We've got, we got a row back here in the back. I don't know if you guys see these guys on the left over here. Almost every chair in that row is filled. I said, man, you guys packed a pew today. I wish there was a prize, but there's not. <laughs> Sorry. And, and, and Gary says, yeah, we had to get here early to get the back row seats. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's usually true in the church, right? <laughs> arrive early. You say, why should I arrive early? Let me give you two thoughts. Number one, when you get here early, you can actually fellowship with the people around you. You can actually say howdy. You can give a hug. You can give a smile or a high five or say, hey, how was your week? Oh, hey, your mom went through this week. How did everything go? How's your kids? How's your dog? Whatever. You can fellowship with uh, fellow believers if you get here early. Amen? Amen. But here's another aspect of it. Get here early so maybe after you fellowship a little bit, you can find a quiet seat to sit in and, and just start preparing your heart to be with God. Preparing your heart to, to worship God. Sitting still for a moment. Maybe opening your Bible to the scripture that's in the bulletin and reading the passage ahead of time. Preparing our heart, getting ready to worship God. That's what happens when you come early. Arrive early. I know some of you are saying, well, if I arrive early, he'll put me to work. I might. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with that either, amen? It's good to serve God, amen? Show up. Show up. Plan ahead. Arrive early. Number three. Please don't take offense, and if you do, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize. In-person church is always better than online church. Always, period, exclamation point, always. Now, let me say this. Many churches were forced to go to online services during COVID. God made it very uh, possible for us to do the same thing, and we did. We entered into the online arena that we had never been in before. Many churches, as COVID ended, said, we'll stop doing online service because that encourages people to stay home and watch it. I kind of understand that, but here, let me say this. Why do we have online services? Sometimes you're sick because you got green snot running down your face. Or you're coughing up a lung. Or you have COVID. Isn't it nice to be able to watch your church at home when you're sick? Yes. Amen. We have people in our church that we would consider, we would call them shut-in. They can't leave to get here for church. Isn't it nice that they can at least participate in some sort of service from, from their church? Maybe you're traveling and you're at a point where you need to pull over. You want to go to church on a Sunday and you're driving. You're like, well, I don't have time to get to a church. I can sit and watch it online. That, that's an applicable arena. But that's what online church is for. The sick, the shut-in, the traveler. It's not for me to say, well, I want to stay in my PJs today, so I'm going to sit in my recliner with my popcorn and my, and my root beer, and I'm going to watch it online not what it's for in person is always better online church is not to be our continual spiritual diet someone said this one time watching church online is like watching a fireplace on your tv set you can see you can hear it but you can't feel the warmth y'all with me it's not real you say, yeah, you videoed it, you recorded it, you put it on, yeah, it's real, hold on a minute, here's what I mean. It's watching them worship. It's watching them study the Bible. It's watching those people do their thing while I sit at home and try to feel the warmth, but I can't. The future of the church is not online church. If we want to be honest this morning, the death of the church is the promotion of online church. Don't come, just stay home. That's the destroyer of the church. The future of the church is what it has always been. A bunch of Christians getting together, singing some songs, worshiping God, praying together, and putting up with a guy like me. That's how church was started. That's how church is to be continued. Can I, can I just say this real quick? i got to move on. Some of you are ready for me to move on. I see it. I see it in your eyes. See, Pastor Ray preaches us show up. We're here. Because sometimes we ain't. And somebody's going to hear this message online that might need to hear this and help them. Amen? Show up. Do you know why pastors and churches are continually beating their heads against the wall to try to figure out new ways to get people in church? What ministry can we start? What can we offer to the community that will draw people in? What program can I get? What prizes can I give away? And by the way, none of those things are wrong in and of themselves. But you know why we're constantly doing that? To get people to show up. 
can I give you a solution? Just show up. <laughs> well, you didn't give away a hat today. Show up anyways. If you want a hat that bad, I'll give you one later, all right? But you show up. Show up. Number one. Thank you in the back. Number one. Show up. Number two. What? You guys are ahead of me? You already know the answer? What would you say, Bonnie? Oh, it wasn't you? Do you want to just come preach? I'll go sit down. I'm just... It was Troy? I'll come back there. I'm bigger than you. <laughs> Number one is what? Number two. Lean in. Lean in. Let me give you this. Number two? Lean in. Don't just show up. Lean in. Acts chapter 17, verse number 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Let, let, me, let me give you, before I tell you what this verse means, let me give you a little parenthesis again here, okay? You know what that, word, you know what that verse really means? Don't do things and believe things because the preacher says so. Don't do things and believe and practice things because that's what the church has always done. Search the scriptures and know why. Search the scriptures and know why. That's the encouragement we're giving in Acts 17. Luke is using this verse to describe the difference between the Bereans and the Thessalonians. Thessalonians. The Bereans, he says in this verse, studied the word of God. What they do? They leaned into it. They leaned into it. They received the word with all readiness of mind. They were ready to hear. They were ready to study when they showed up because they'd already spent time. In the word of God. Church is not a passive entertainment experience like the Thessalonians were, were viewing it as. They, uh, the Bereans were in the word of God searching the word of God. Can I just give you this thought about leaning in? <laughs> don't, don't come to church and behave like you did when you were 15. I'll find the back row seat, no offense over here. I'll slouch in my chair, I'll put my head against the wall, and I'll stare at the ceiling, and I'll dare that preacher to say something that makes me laugh or that I understand or that I enjoy. I'm just here. I'm just here. It's part of the experience. Church is not supposed to be an experience that you watch. Church is supposed to be an experience that you participate in. Watching is passive. Participating is active. Amen? Amen. That's why we ask you to sing. That's why we ask you to pray. That's why we hope every now and then you might say amen or raise a hand and praise to God. Why? What are we doing? We're participating. You say, well, how do I participate? How do I participate? Well, let me just say this. Bring your Bible. Read along. You forget it. We have it on the screen. It's where I know that. Bring your Bible. Take some notes. At worship time, sing along. You say, Pastor, you've never heard me sing. Man, the coyotes go crazy when I sing. Can't carry a tune in a bucket. I'm not asking you to carry a tune in a bucket. I'm not asking you to sound pretty. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You, you want to be comfortable in a place like this? Lean in. Lean into the worship time. Lean into the singing. Uh, lean in. Listen, the singing time is not the choir performing for you. The singing time is not Frank showing how good of a voice he has as he leads you. The singing time is this. Hey, we all join in and we all participate. Lean in. Lean in. You say, I don't feel comfortable at church. Are you leaning in? Are you leaning in? I, I, I want to give you this. <laughs> when you think about singing, especially in the, in the arena of worship, I am not asking you to sing like somebody else. There are certain people in our church that, man, when they sing, you're just like, oh. Their voice is soothing and smooth. There are some that have that nice vibrato at the end, you know. Ooh. There are some that can harmonize with anybody. Boy, they just sound so good. I'm not asking you to be them. I'm saying this. You want to be comfortable in church? Lean in. Sing in whatever capacity and ability God has given you. If that's three notes off key, you sing it for the joy of the Lord. Amen? Terry, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Lean in. Lean in. 
I've noticed there's about, there's about three types of people in the church in, during the worship service. The first group I, we call the, uh, the Midwest Stoics. They are fully worshiping God and singing, but it goes something like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. They're fully engaged. They're giving their heart. And at the end, a little amen. Amen. That's as good as it's going to get. But then you also have the southern ameners. The southern ameners, man, uh, it's, uh, they can't go three minutes without saying amen. Amen. And it's not even when I ask you to. Because when I ask you to, you all do. Amen. amen. They just do it all over the place. I could be saying, last night I was sick to my stomach. Amen. They're not like the Midwest Stoics. Amen. <laughs> so you got the, you got the, southern, uh, the, the, the southern ameners. Uh, Roger's not here this morning. <laughs> Roger's a southern amener. Amen. The third group, I call the West Coast Dancers. They freelance it, man. They dance all over the place. They got their hands in the air. They're moving and swaying with the music. They're shouting, woo, all the time. They're excited to be here. The Midwest Stoics look at them and say, you guys are crazy. And they look at the Midwest Stoics and say, you don't love Jesus. Now, now let me say that because you probably fit into one of those three categories. Instead of judging each other in how we worship, the concept is not how you worship and sing. The concept is that you do worship and sing. Lean in. Lean in. Your heart should show your love for Jesus Christ in the way that you worship Jesus Christ. Not in a specific style or method because we all come from various backgrounds. But you should lean in to the worship service. Lean into the Bible study. Lean into the singing. Lean into prayer time. Lean into praise time. Actively participate and be a part of what's going on. In every aspect of the service, from the first note to the last amen, participate. Lean in. Get all you can. Lean in. Number one. Show up. Thank you, Bill. Number two. Lean in. Number three. Number three. I've got to show you the slide. Give back. Give back. Now, before I start, I'm going to say this right now. Do not turn your hearing aids off. <laughs> Do not allow your mind to float in the twilight zone, because as soon as I said the word give, you thought, he wants our money. Okay? Bear with me. Hold on. Give back. I'm going to say it. Number three. Give back. <sighs> Number three. Give back. Thank you. Luke 6, chapter 38. Chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give unto your bosom. For that same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. What a tremendous verse on giving. Amen? You give, and what happens? God gives back. As God has given to us, which by the way is everything that we have, we are supposed to give back to Him. The more we give to Him the more he gives to us. The more he gives to us, the more we give to him, the more he gives to us. The more we give to him, the more he gives to us. The more we give to him, the more he gives to us. Y'all with me? It's a never-ending cycle. I give, he gives back. And by the way, he always outgives me. Every single time. He always outgives me. Give back. The only antidote if you struggle with greed is generosity. Generosity. The more I give, the more I enjoy God. The more I enjoy God, the more I enjoy God's people in God's house. Why do we give? Why do we give? Let me give you two thoughts. First of all, giving changes you inside. Giving changes you inside. Uh, let me start by saying this. Giving is a heart matter. When you get saved, you're a new creature. Old things pass away, all things come new. Uh, you get saved, and all of a sudden, things in life begin to change. Your thoughts, your direction, your goals, your life, the family that you're now in with God, right? Everything starts to change. God then begins to work on your heart and say, hey, you should do this, and you shouldn't do this. And so then we start making changes as God leads us and directs us. You realize that giving is one of those decisions? People who are unsaved who might visit a church service very rarely, and I'm not going to say never, but very rarely feel compelled to give in the offering. Okay? 
giving changes me inside because it's a heart decision. I don't even have, it's over there, it ain't got any money in it. If God has our pocketbook, the reality is God has our heart. Because that money is what we cling on to most in our lives. That's the hardest thing to pry out of our hands, amen? Give and giving changes back to us. It's kind of like, let me, let me explain it this way. It's kind of like Christmas. When you're a child, up to maybe about 12, 13, maybe 14 years of old, um, Christmas is a big deal to you. And here's the reason why. You can't wait for Christmas morning for what reason? To get gifts and open them. Right? That's all kids care about. They don't care about Jesus' birthday. They don't care about family getting together. What gift am I going to get to open? At some point, hopefully around teenage age, right, a, a switch flips in your mind. And you start thinking this. I'd like to give a good gift this year. And maybe you work part-time at the ice cream shop. And you think, man, I want to really, give Pastor a really good gift this year. <laughs> Y'all listen. You're taking notes? Y'all taking notes here? This, this, you're supposed to be writing this stuff down. Write this down. And so you save your quarters and your nickels and your dimes and your pennies and your dollars. And then before Christmas, the week of, maybe you go out and you buy that special gift for mom. Not for pastor, okay? Buy it for mom. You buy mom that special gift. And then that teenager wraps it and looks like it's something that came out of the swamp that Shrek lives in, right? And uh, she, they put it under a tree and they're like, I can't wait till mom opens this. Can't wait till mom opens this. Can't wait till mom opens this. And then Christmas morning comes, mom opens that. And they're like, yes, yes, I hope she loves it. And of course, mom, you get this and you're like, oh, it's the best thing ever. Right? What happened? The kid realized it's more blessed to give than receive. Uh, the real joy of Christmas is not in the receiving, it's in the giving. Amen. Same thing's true at church. Same thing's true at church. The first time you come, you probably come with this attitude. What am I going to get out of church today? And you might leave saying, wow, singing spoke to my heart. Oh, the message was eh, it's okay, but you know I enjoyed it. People were kind. The usher helped me find a seat and helped me with some questions that I had. Everything worked out well. I got I got some good stuff out of church today. As you mature as a Christian, you realize something different. The coolest and the best and the most awesomest thing about church is not what I get out of church, but how and what I can give back. The switch flips. So, some of you, recently, or now, or even a while ago, have started experiencing this in your life. You started experiencing the fact that it is more fun, it is, it is more uh, life-changing for me to give than it is to receive. And so you started doing that. <laughs> some people, <laughs> I hate to even bring this up, but you asked, so I'm going to tell you. Some people have left a good, Bible-preaching, solid church and went to join another church, and this was their reason. I'm just not getting anything. Yeah. Now, no, hold on a minute. There are sometimes that is 100% valid. If they're not preaching the Bible, if they're not giving biblical truth that are doctrinally correct in Scripture, you're not getting what you should leave. But to pick apart things and say, I'm, not, I'm just not getting what I feel I need. My first question is this. My first question is this, do you have a heart issue, first of all? My second question is this, what are you giving? Because the more I give in and give back, the more I enjoy the experience to begin with. Giving changes us. But, but I don't want to stop there, because here's the next thing. Giving changes others. Giving changes others. Do you know why people, we had, uh, we had a, a man saved last Sunday in church. We had people join the church last Sunday church. You know why people get saved at church and get baptized at church and have their lives change at church and grow in church and we see visitors come and they come back and they get involved? In you know why all that happens? Giving. You say, no, that doesn't make sense. Here's the reality. If we don't give, we can't turn the lights on. Amen. If we don't give, we can't run the air conditioner in the winter. <laughs> you all said, I'm not giving anymore. I'm done. <laughs> No heat, no air. <laughs> Y'all with me? Yeah. Giving impacts far more than just me. It changes others. Life changes happen all over the time at church. The reason some of you sitting in these chairs are so invested in this church 
is because not just your life has been changed from being here. You have witnessed the change in other people's life. And so you continue to invest in the church. This is the why of what we do when it comes to giving. You want to know what church is really all about? It's not what can I get. It's about what can I give back. What can I give back? It changes you and it changes others. So how do we give back? How do we give back? I want to give you a fourfold step, step-by-step process in giving called the pathway of giving. Okay? The pathway of giving. Number one, pathway to giving starts with this. I become a first-time giver. I show up. I throw five or ten bucks in the offering plate. First time ever, that was, that, was a, that, was a, that was my first time gift, okay? Now, we don't pass a plate there. We've got plates around. We've got a box on the wall. I put my five bucks in there, okay? Now, let me say this about that five bucks. First of all, that's not a real big sacrifice, is it, five bucks? I mean, that'll get us about a half a gallon of gas or a third of a Subway sandwich, right? But uh, <laughs> it's not a big sacrifice, but it's the action of I'm, I'm a giver, first time giver. The second step is then to become a regular giver. A regular giver is a person who every week they're here puts something in the offering plate. I'm a giver. I'm a regular giver. Okay? The third step is this. Then I become a tither. Now let me explain this real quick. In the Old Testament, it demanded a 10% tithe. The New Testament does not necessarily have those demands, but it is a great principle for me to get used to doing and giving and have a kind of a, an idea of what to give, that 10% of my regular income scheduled to give every week or monthly if you give monthly become a tither the fourth step is our goal as a church not so that i can buy fancy suits and nice cars okay because i don't i don't i don't get to take the money out of the offering plate y'all with me it's like the kids they're arguing whose whose parents made more and the one guy says the one little kid says my dad makes a lot of money he writes a few words on a simple paper and calls it a poem and they pay him a hundred dollars for every one he writes the other kid says well my dad writes books children's books and every, every children's book he writes, they give him $500. And the other boy, he says, well, my dad's a preacher. And when he's done, it takes eight men to collect his pay. <laughs> That's not the purpose of why, okay? But becoming a tither, I, I give regularly that 10%. But the fourth step is the most important. And this is the one we all should strive for and the church has put, wants. Become an extravagant giver. Everything I have is his. Everything. He simply says this, would you give back? An extravagant giver goes far above 10% tithe. They give to missions. They give to uh, building programs. They give to special needs. Uh, they give to this and they give to that whenever it's necessary. They give, they give, they give. That's, that's the fourth step, the extravagant giver. Now, let me say this real quick, okay? Because I, I, I see some glazed eyes coming out. I don't preach on money a lot. You know that. I've been here, I'll be here three years in just a few days. I'll have been the pastor here at Calvary Baptist Church. I, I think maybe one sermon I've actually preached a significant portion of it on giving. But let me say this. I think I would do you a great disservice if I didn't teach you what the scripture says about giving that says this. You give, you'll enjoy it more. You give, you'll enjoy church more. You'll be more comfortable. It'll be your place. Uh, you'll enjoy it. The Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. You'll stop being uncomfortable when we start becoming a giver. Let me, get, let me put a little PS on here. We talked about money there, but giving is not always financial. We need to give back our time to the Lord. We should tithe our time, amen? God has given every one of us talents and abilities to serve him with. Serve him. Lean into service, amen, as you give back. Let's talk about our, our talents, you guys have talents to use for the Lord. Your talents are different than mine, and mine than yours, and yours than the person next to you. Are you using those talents for the Lord? That's giving back. It's giving back. Give back. Number one, show up. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Number two, number three, number four, look around. Number four, look around. Three of you got it. Good job. You're still writing. Okay, let me give you a second. Number four. Look around. Look around. Look around. When you come to church, you want to make this your comfortable place? You want to make this a place that you enjoy and, and it's your home? It's going to require you to look around. Now, let's do something this morning. Let's have a social experiment. I want everybody, and I, I said everybody, everybody. Do you want to know what that word means? Everybody. 
everybody, okay? I want everybody to look around. Go on, start looking at people. Go on, look at people. That means you got to turn your neck. Look at everybody. What do you see? A bunch of weirdos, right? <laughs> right? All right. Y'all look weird. Okay, you can stop looking around. I'll tell you what some of them said about you <laughs> later, okay? <laughs> look like a bunch of weirdos out there looking at weird people. Why look around? Because church is not a passive watch experience. It's an active experience that you're supposed to participate in, which includes people looking around. Hebrews 10, 24 says this, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You realize that part of looking around is a place for me to help other people, help them grow in the Lord, help them do good things. Uh, church is not a place to show up once a week for spiritual entertainment. It's a place where you look around, and in looking around, don't miss this, you get to know other people. You get to know other people. You learn to love those people. You learn to help, in those, help, help those people. And then you start strengthening and developing your relationships with those people. If you come to church and you've been coming for a while and you say something like this, who's that guy that sits back there? I don't even know him. You know whose fault that is? It ain't mine. Not only do you have a full color directory, amen. <laughs> but it's okay to get up out of your seat every now and then and go sit in a different section to meet people. Amen. Look around. <laughs> Look around. Uh, deepen, deepen your relationships with people. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, um, somewhere up here, here it is, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. Why look around? Because of the needs of others. The needs of others. We should come into church every time we enter these doors, and this should be the question on our mind. Who in the church is hurting right now? Who is hurting right now? Now, let me just say this. If you're new to church or if you're a new Christian, when you come to church, you're probably focusing on your own hurts. That's why we're here. We're here to help you with those hurts. As you mature as a Christian, though, and you grow, you don't come into church overwhelmed by your own hurt and your own problems. You come in concerned and thinking about others who are hurting. That person that sits down the road from me, man, they're really going through it. How can I help them today? How can I pray for them today? How can I meet their need today? You should ask when you get here, who can I help here today? You should ask yourself this question. Now, don't you start turning me off here, okay? I ain't done yet. Give me a few more minutes, all right? Bear with me. The, the, the roast won't burn. You should ask this question. Who can I sit with today? Who can I sit with today? Let me tell you something that is always a good thing. And I know some of you are going to say, I, I'm just comfortable in my spot. It is always good to leave your spot to go sit with somebody who walked in these doors who's never been here before. You will never hear a pastor get up and say, Oh, you bunch of buzzers getting up out of your seat and sitting with visitors. What's wrong with you? But you will hear a pastor say if it's an issue, Hey, three visitors walked in the door. Nobody even said hi to them. Hello. Look around. Who can I sit with today? Who can I sit with today? I'll leave my spot. <gasps> You're in my seat. Last time I checked, there ain't a single person in the room that bought one of these seats. Personally. Okay, it may have come into the corporate giving. I don't know how they were bought when they were bought, but there ain't no names on them. Amen. I love looking around and seeing somebody in different spots because somebody else is in your seat. I love it. You're probably like, I hate it. Shut up, Pastor. I love it. Bonnie's over here one day, she's over here one day, she's down here one day, and vice versa. And then we get winter visitors. And then they come in and they take your normal spot. Move. <laughs> Who can I help today? Who can I sit with today? Who can I encourage today? How about this when I get here? Who can I invite to lunch today? Oh, pastor, that's weird. You know why you think it's weird? Because you're treating church like a movie theater. You ever went to see a movie? 200 seat auditorium and there's like six people in there? And I promise you, unless they're family, they aren't sitting together. You ever walk in that movie theater with your big old, you got to get the big popcorn. 
I have that, I have that thing gone before the introductions are, you know, I, 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 you got to get the big popcorn, right? You get your big old soda, right? And you go in there, you look around, all these empty seats. Oh, that guy's sitting by himself. I'm going to go sit by him. And you go and you walk down, don't know the guy, and you just sit down right beside him. You're like, hey, dude, what's up? You know, he thinks, you're weird. <laughs> There's 190 empty seats. Why are you sitting beside me? And then you say, hey, you want to go to lunch when this is done? That is weird. That is weird. It doesn't work in that environment. Why? Because a movie is a passive experience. Church is an active experience. You, you, you actively look around. You build and you strengthen relationships with God's people. It's how church was established and it's how church will always be. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, look at the needs of others. The needs of others. We've had Proverbs 17 a minute ago. Proverbs 18, 24. Look at this. A man that hath friends must what? Show himself friendly. Show himself friendly. Let me help you with something, okay? Some people will say, I don't need any more friends. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. Let me be helpful for just a minute, but very serious. I, I, I've said a lot of fun, funny things. You know, we've joked and we laughed a little bit, okay? I, I, I want to be really serious for just a minute. There are some people that come to church and their desire is to truly develop and strengthen relationships, friendships. But even in having that desire, they hop churches every two years when things get tough. The key to building relationships is consistency. Consistency. People say, I just don't have any friends at that church. Could it be that you refuse to arrive early? Could it be that you refuse to stay a few minutes after the service? Could it be because you refuse to develop and invest deeply in other people? Or could it be because you always leave early? Now, let, let me explain this real quick. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm be serious. When I say leave early, here's what I mean. Some people leave the church over something petty or because something gets hard or difficult or the church is going through a tough time. I'll just leave. That's why we don't develop relationships like we ought to. That's why we don't have the Christian brothers and sisters that are our friends the way we ought to. We leave too early. Well, what about this? Maybe you leave too early by not getting involved in the things that are going on. You stay in the church, but you never get involved in a Sunday school class and get to know your classmates. Amen. You never come to a Wednesday night service and, and, and get to pray for the people that you go to church with. You, you never come to a fellowship. You never get involved in an activity. And then you wonder, why, why in the world don't I have those relationships? It's because you're leaving too early. And I'm not just talking about sticking around after the service and talking. Fellas. That's great. That's wonderful. I love it. We have, we, all of our deacons, we rotate who, who locks up the building and who shuts off the lights. And it used to be, I think when I first got here, Larry, everybody was like closing prayer out the door. <laughs> and now you got people hanging out and no one's back They're like are you guys ever going to leave I want to lock up and go home <laughs> right that's a good thing but I'm not talking about that specifically leaving early after church although we do sometimes maybe we should stick around I'm talking about leaving when things get tough leaving the whole church or leaving by not participating in what's offered <laughs> pastor I'm just not getting fed do you show up to get fed do you lean in to get fed? Do you give back to get fed? Do you look around to get fed? Hello? Pastor, I, I, I'm just, I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave. I just don't have good friends there, and I just don't feel like uh, there's, there's things for me there. You know, my first question is, are you participating in the things that are there? When we leave early, we don't build those relationships. Look around. Look around. You know why we do other things than Sunday morning church? We have Sunday school, we have Sunday night, we have Wednesday night, we have fellowship activities. You know why we do that? Because we need each other. Especially in the midst of the sinful world that we live in. Don't allow... Somebody's going to get mad at me here, and I'm, I'm fine with that right now. Don't allow your socially backward skills to say, I can't participate in that because I'm shy. Get over yourself. Shake it off. Because somebody needs you. Or you need somebody. 
Pastor, I need counseling. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to meet with you. I need counseling. I said, what's the issue? Blah, 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 blah. I said, you're not going to believe this. I just had a six-week Sunday night series on that. Oh, you did? Yeah, you didn't show up. What's happening? We're leaving too early. We're leaving too early. Uh, look around to see others that need help. Look around to see others that you can be blessing to. Look around uh, to see how can I get involved in something. Look around to see, hey, what, what more can I do for Christ in this place? How can I serve better? What can I get involved with? But let me say this as well. Look around today. Look around today and find a face of somebody who's not here. You say, well, I don't know everybody. Grab a directory on your way out if you didn't get one, all right? Look around for somebody who's not here. And you know what you need to do this week? Minister to them. Encourage them. Say, I prayed for you this week. I sure would like to sit with you next. <gasps> Offer to sit with them? That means I might have to move. Come on. Look around. There are needs around us daily. And we're like the, the, the camel, the camel, the flamingo, what is it? The bears his head in the sand? The ostrich. the ostrich. Thank you. I knew it was one of them birds. Like a camel. Camel's a bird. We don't get to be naive and think ignorance is bliss because it's not. There are needs. There are areas of service we can get involved in. There are people who need us and our support. Lean in. Show up. Give back. Look around. Let me give you this last one, number five. We've got to hurry. I already said the needs of others there. Let me get back to how to answer. Number five, focus on. Focus on. I'm going to say number five. You say the rest. Five. Focus on. Now, without reading scripture, what should the focus of our church be on? Jesus. What is it? Jesus. Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 says this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. Our eyes as a church. You want to be comfortable? Keep your eyes on Christ. You want to enjoy church? Keep your eyes on Christ. You want to get more involved in church and make this say, hey, that's my church. That's where I go. That's where I worship. That's where I fellowship. That's where I pray. That's where I get fed. That's where I love to go. Make it yours. How? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Many problems come when we take our focus off of Jesus and we focus on something else. If you focus on this pastor, your spiritual life is going to decline faster than you think. Don't put your eyes on me. I'm going to fail you. I'm going to let you down. I'm going to call you out in a sermon. You're going to get mad at me. I'm going to use you as an illustration. You're going to be offended, okay? It's going to happen. Don't put your eyes on me. Keep them on Jesus. No matter how good the pastor is, and I think yours is pretty good. I'm just kidding. He will let you down. He's going to miss your kid's graduation or birth, you know? He's not going to make it one time when you're in the hospital because he couldn't get It's going to happen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. People put their focus on other Christians. I wish I could run the race they're running. I wish my life was like theirs. I wish, hey, keep your eyes on the others. That'll really let you down. Don't try to run their race. Don't try to keep up with them. Run the race God has given you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't focus on your failures, your mistakes of the past. Keep your focus on Jesus. Don't focus on the fears of this old world, which are plenteous. Keep your eyes on Jesus. See, when we take our eyes off Jesus, we become like Peter. We'll walk on that water, but as soon as we take our eyes off Jesus, the storm begins to engulf us. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Focus on. Focus on. If you forget, if you forget to focus on Jesus alone, there will be some falling away. Focus on Jesus. Number one, show up. Number two, Number three, number four, number five, focus on Jesus. So I went to prison. I held the preaching service. I preached with all my heart the message that God had given me. Several men got saved that night. A bunch of other men walked and made a, a decision, was prayed with. Tears were shed. Victories were won. Burdens were overcome. Prayers were lifted up. And when I left that place, I felt way more comfortable than when I entered that place. When I first got there, still a little bit uncomfortable. I remember hearing some of the inmates saying things like, hey, is that the pastor? Oh, we haven't heard him before. We can't wait till he speaks to us. Hey, is that the pastor? I want to introduce myself. I want to make sure I get to talk to him. Hey, is that the pastor? Man, I can't wait to meet him. Man, a bunch of them had, had, had the whole service. 
after the invitation, people getting saved and all those things happened. After the service, those men would come up to me and say, man, that was great. We really appreciate what you said. Man, that was a good message. Man, we hope you'll come back. Anytime you want to come to our service, we'd love to have you come and speak to us. Please, please, please come back. We loved having you. I got in the car with my church member, started heading home. He said, what do you think? Did you like it? I'm still thinking, well, let me tell it this way. I came in real uncomfortable, but I left feeling pretty comfortable. I look back at that experience, and this is what I see. A bunch of people who knew I did not fit in and was not comfortable went out of their way to make me feel comfortable in a place I was not comfortable with. A bunch of inmates knew, man, that guy don't belong here. He ain't got no street cred, right? He doesn't belong here. He's never shanked anyone, <laughs> right? He ain't done the stuff we've done. He done. So let's, let's make him feel comfortable and welcome. And when I left there, I was like, I'll come back. That was great. I, I, I enjoyed those men. Can I close with this? Wouldn't it be great if the church was as welcoming as that prison is? Actively looking for the new guy to try to help. Actively seeking someone who has a burden to try to help. Involved in giving and making this my church. Showing up and leaning into the things of God. If we can follow those five church hacks... I can promise you this, you will enjoy church more and you will begin feeling real comfortable in this home. Real comfortable. My challenge to us this morning, church, is this. Let's, uh, besides focusing on Jesus, let's follow the hacks. Because unlike the internet hacks, you'll find out these actually work. These actually work. You'll enjoy church more. You'll be more comfortable. You'll serve more. You'll give. You'll study. You'll lean in. You'll invite people. You'll get them to get comfortable. And the cycle just keeps on going. Will you follow the five church hacks? I promise you. I promise you. If you're new to church, these will help you. If you're old, you've been in church all your life, they'll still help you. Because we forget a lot of them as we get older. Amen? Will you follow these friends? Let's be as welcoming to the new guy. As the prison was to the new guy. I promise you folks. I promise you. You'll feel more comfortable. Every time we participate in these things. Show up. Lean in. Give back. Look around. Focus on. Father. Lord this morning I pray you'll take what's been said. And use it to help us. Encourage us Lord. Grow us. Make us more comfortable in this place. That we call church. Our, our, our family, Lord, of fellow believers. Make us enjoy. Make us understand. Make us uh, realize that these hacks are something that will change how we view church and how comfortable we are in church and, and our perception of what we should do within the church. These things will help us. Lord, may we show up faithfully. Lord, may we, may we just not have an excuse to miss, but just be here. May we lean into the study and to the singing and to the worship. Lord, may we give back what's rightfully yours anyways. God, I pray you'll help us to look around. Help us to see the needs of others. Help us to see the burdens of others, how we can help. Help us to see areas in which we could get involved in serving. And then God, help us to keep our focus on Jesus Christ. But we know if we can do these things that you will do with the church what only you can do. And we'll thank you for what you do. Help us, Lord, to follow this formula, I pray. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed, no one's looking. Just a brief invitation, we'll sing a verse or two and be done. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, first of all, I, I'm, I am a born-again child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have a doubt in my mind, not because of my baptism or my good works or because I'm in church today. It's because I met Jesus, and I have a relationship with the King of Kings. I'm trusting him to get me to heaven. If I were to die right now, I'm on my way to heaven, and I know that. Would you do this? Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to rejoice with you. Amen. Good, 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 good. Hands all over. Good, 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 good. You can put them down. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe every hand in the building. But if I missed you, maybe you'd say, I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me, preacher? I'd love to have that privilege this morning. Anybody say that? I'm just not sure. Nobody's looking. Just slip your hand up, slip it right down. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? All right. One last question. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. 
all the hacks that are out there. And you'll find probably 90% of them don't even work. But yet we try them. We try them for ease. We try them for comfort. We try them for convenience. We try them because it's something new. How about this? How about taking the five church hacks and saying today, I'll be committed to these things this year. Last year we preached moving forward with God. Last week. Forward with God. You know what's going to help you move forward with God? Following the five church hacks. I promise you. I guarantee it. Will we follow them? Maybe this morning you need to make a commitment in one of these areas or all of these areas. I don't know your need. But I do know these five things are very relevant and very needed in our lives and in our churches today. Show up. Be here. Lean in. Learn. Give back. Look around. Focus on. Father, bless our invitation now as we sing. Decisions need to be need to be made. Commitments need to be offered. Whatever the case may be this morning. I pray, Lord, that we'll settle that during the invitation. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning? We'll sing a verse to Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow, number 593. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. true in our lives. Uh, Brother Bob, would you close in prayer, please?